top medical centers with this specialist remarkable prescribed story spans three continents. Safe to say, none of us could have imagined the world we are living in today. one of the country's best, most interesting, beautifully spoken chefs, your life crashed to a halt, right? In one week, the way all, yeah. our, all of ours did. So I want to ask what that was like, because I've talked to lots and lots of restaurant owners and haven't gotten to ask you, what has your life been like in the past three weeks? Wow. Uh, well, Corby, it, it was a shock. I guess you can think about it as a shock because... Sometimes you have no idea what's going to happen, right? And when I say no idea, um, February 24th, I'm in a big room in Miami at South Beach Food and Wine. I'm giving a speech and uh, I see all my chef buddies, you know, everybody in that room. And it was my wife's birthday. And I've read and knew about Corona at that point. Uh, but also was a little bit like, well, they're not talking about it over here. And in Sweden, with that, you know that we operate a lot of Scandinavia, nothing, nada, not one conversation about it. There's obviously a dialogue about Italy was hit really bad already, but it was something definitely over there, whatever there was. And a week later, it went from something that I kind of had in the back of my mind to took over everything. So worldwide, we're operating in eight countries, 30 restaurants. We had to, in three days, shut all of them down. All of them? Yeah, all of them. So imagine, you know, Montreal for a season in French, that's a different dialogue than Oslo in, and in a seafood restaurant versus Helsinki. What do we do in London? And you start to realize how exposed you are in your professional life, which essentially then deals with your personal life, right? And and publicly, how do you how do you deal with it? And also on every place, how do you uh, change your staffing situation? Because in Sweden, we have a system. You can go on unemployment. It's done like that. You have seven to eight months. Canada kind of looks more like Sweden. London, England, kind of in between America and Sweden. She was also on a technical level, very difficult. How do you unload and offload and what do you keep open and what do you tell your team? So very but, challenging. What did you tell them and how many were there? Because I've talked to so many restaurant owners who had to lay off hundreds of people overnight. One of them, including his own father. Wow. Yeah, so we're... Um, in the direct restaurant that we operate. I mean, overall, it impacts maybe three, 4,000 people, right? But the, over, the people that we complete, directly work with, it's about 750 people in eight countries. Jeez. And, uh, you know, that means that we probably had 15 general managers conversation, uh, a team of 60, 70 managers in total, right? Uh, and and it, it has to, how do you culturally sound okay in each place? There's a kind of a different plan in, in New York versus Miami versus Montreal, but it's kind of still also means the same. We are closing the restaurant for an unseeable, a foreseeable future, and here are the next steps. Did you try convening talks with each of the managers and have you been able to keep anybody employed? Yes. So the first week, and I want to say that was the first week of March, we dealt with the shutdown. The second week, we were really like, okay, but what can we do? We have capable and incredible people, right? So once we took care of step one, which was very important for us, was and that's when we decided right away to, wait, 
let's start work with Jose, Andres, and World Central Kitchen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we couldn't do that everywhere, but we can definitely do that in, in three locations. And so we're doing it at Red Rooster Harlem, Marcus BNP in Newark, and in Red Rooster Overtown. And Red Rooster Overtown, we hadn't even opened. We were a week away from opening. So we're doing this based on, yes, we can now re-employ some staff, not a lot, but about five to seven on each place. We serve about 500 people a day. But then also imagine the whole structure of restaurant is interrupted, right? From the farmer to the delivery guy to, and to all of these roles that are in the hemisphere of restaurant that you might not think about, right? All of that is interrupted by working with World Central Kitchen in a, in a different way. There is a way to save that infrastructure. And that's really one of the reasons why we've been doing it, besides doing a good cost in the community. World Central Kitchen. So they're prioritizing a couple of things. They're prioritizing first re-employing the people who are out of work. Yeah feeding the people who are out of work. So using the out of work restaurant workers to help give meals to the suddenly unemployed people. And then what I'm doing with my food program at Aspen Institute, feeding healthcare workers, because I'm now working on streamlining all the different health protocols, food serving protocols, delivery protocols when it comes to feeding healthcare workers. With you, with your three kitchens, which I think World Central Kitchen is calling community kitchens, maybe you are too, yeah, who are you feeding? So that's a great, a great question because there, it's actually different in each community. So in Harlem, we're feeding the direct community and it's a line out the door. We stop at about 500 portions a day. And it's also a new way of feeding, right? So we had to learn. So World Central Kitchen's guidelines were very important. You set up a six foot table, you take the food, you drop it at the table, you ask your, your customer really, how many people is in your family? You step back, they step up. You do it with gloves, all of the guidelines, right? Yes, absolutely. These are the World Central Kitchen COVID guidelines because yes. they're, they're like the best and most stringent, but I'm trying to um, streamline them all to make it of use nationally. So we've got yeah. a sort of one size fits all template, which lots of people are supporting and they're asking for. But that, and and that, is, that is important to follow because that was a change for me, right? I've never done this before. So it was, I was very, uh, I was grateful for them to giving us those guidelines. So, mm -hmm. so that's one in Harlem, the direct community and in the, one of the neediest, I mean, look, for Harlem has food insecurities without COVID-19. For sure. Right? So we, we, we have a purpose in the community normally anyway. In Newark, we focused, we cook all the food and we focused on the first responders. So nurses, police officers, firemen, all of them. Fantastic. In, in, in Overtown, it's actually a combination. So the community's first, but then also first responders are within that as well. And, you know, it's, it's when you work the line, you can get all the information from, from the offices you want. When you work the line, nothing gets me more than working the line. I walked over today with my wife. I said, you have to see this. And the line is the one that encouraging us. Are you okay, chef? Make sure you stay six feet apart. Um, and it's really when true humanity comes out, right? And I have to... I couldn't be prouder for our, our staff in this moment because a month ago, I would not, if you would have asked me that this is what we were doing, I would have said, Corby, you're absolutely out of your mind, but this is what we're doing and we better do it to the best of our capabilities. So on an everyday basis, how are you like holding it together? Your wife, your family, you took your wife down to have a look. What's it like personally for you day by day? Uh, well, I try to think about the positive first. And one amazing thing has been that we're in the middle of teaching my son how to ride a bike. So there's been more time to teach him to ride a bike. Not sure if he's doing any better or not, but at least it's probably more for me than for him. So that's been fun. And I've cooked every meal, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You're and really serious about this. You cooked every meal. 
every meal and it's been therapeutic for me like the process of it and and also thinking about i didn't know how much dry stuff we had at home you know we have beans <laughs> my wife was prepared for something uh you know so it's been it's it's been that right but also it's it's difficult and you don't like what i said to my wife we can't complain but we can vent to each other right uh because we're healthy and you know we all lost our friend floyd cardos we all you know an amazing person amazing chef and that was probably the hardest when that week when we lost floyd four other of my friends uh had the virus uh, they all except floyd made out of it but you know speaking to someone that has it day nine day 10 when they really go through it it's it's horrible it's really 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 bad for them so um you know they always say what doesn't kill you makes you stronger i doubt that sometimes like because this is this is horrible this is bad um, but what about your family? <clears throat> like, just tell us how old your son is. My son, our son is three and a half, and um, he does his video conferences with his class. And one of the one of the kids in class said, "I don't want to see my friends. I want to be with my friends." And when Naya said that, I was like, "That's how we all feel." She's just four and said, "You know, like, that emotion. Like, we're done with this now. We kind of want to, especially people like us, like." we are in these industries because we generally like people like i like my carrot lady i like the fish guy that we argue about where he got the fish from like i need the pork guy to come in and 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 talk, talk to me about how he feeds all the pigs with apples and and so on right and those are routines that we all build up and i can't wait to argue with my sous chef about which special we're going to put on and that it's not good enough these things that we all took for granted we want them. The thing of fear and unknown, right? Humans were never good at that. We can take hard times. We can take less money. Uh, we're very creative in terms of all of that. But fear and unknown, those two things combined, and that's so, what, so much of what this is. Uh, and we're not used to that, right? Because we, especially in the West, because we're used to having, here's the problem, here's how you solve it. And even if we don't solve it, we, we, we kind of used to be on that road at least. But when you say we, it, it's restaurant owners and chefs who are everyday, minute by minute problem solvers. So yes. you're talking particularly about yourselves. Yes. And we're also in deep need of human connection from every part of the supply chain, COVID, from dealing with customers, dealing with our staff, dealing with our purveyors, dealing with management and owner team. These are things that this is one of the reasons why you are in our business because you like people, you're a people person. So I do think, it's very early, I do think that there will be a post here that, uh, I hate to say it, but depression and um, just, this is so different for us. And, but, but, but it's also great stuff like Waxman and I, we speak, almost every day, just checking in on each other. And Jonathan was very early on this. Jonathan was like, hey, it's very important that we speak to each other, all of us. And, and I'm calling, so, so we all took that on, right? And, and so you know, I just spoke to Danielle, uh, you know, I'm, I'm talking to Alex Conacelli, I spoke to Amanda the other day, Scott. So we staying in contact, because not because we need something from each other, but just because we need to hear that voice. Do you share? anxieties or worries and tell us are you completely untouched by anxiety from your wonderful a carefree swedish upbringing or do you have anxiety <laughs> i i really appreciate I, I can't tell you this is not a small thing but i'm part of a community that is much larger than me right the, the, our community it's not just chefs it's all of us right and i've never needed the community more than now we have uh, so many great things that's come out of this on the back end, right? So behind the scenes, Independent Restaurant Coalition has been built. Will Gadera, Dana Meyer. I'm talking the Independent Restaurant Coalition right after this call. Yes. So, so the, the, the friendship, the, the sharing of ideas, how does this 
and, and just true problem solving. Can we get, how can we get the money? How, what are you doing with staff? Like all of those questions that are real technical questions. We talk to each other in the morning, we talk to each other at night. Just having that support, that has been amazing. Um, I, I, I am scared um, and worried, but I have to tell you, I've drawn from a couple of things because I, I've drawn from being an immigrant. Remember coming to this country with nothing and why I came, mm -hmm. this level of hope and why I came to America. So that has helped me also thought a lot about genes. Uh, my Ethiopian father was a tribe leader and uh, my Swedish father uh, was the first person in his whole village to go to university. So I remember as a child coming back to the summer village when my father, he was a geologist and had a PhD, but he was the only one that could really read technical papers for the village. So all kinds of fishermen came up with their stuff, with their notes, and he had to kind of translate them to them. So I say that, so both in my upbringing and in my genes, I've been around leaders that went through tough times. You know, a fishing village, as you know, in Sweden, especially in the, in the 50s and 60s, it was very poor, just very, very poor. But they had to solve stuff. Same thing with the tribe in Ethiopia. So I draw more from that time. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we, we all operate very different, but I kind of needed that and, and spoke to my sisters a lot about that. What did dad used to say? And, and so I had to go back to being that child sitting at that kitchen table, listening to my dad and my grandparents' stories. And also that moment when I decided to come here as an immigrant, when you, when you move as an immigrant, you, you know you have nothing, but you're working towards that end of the light, towards the end of the tunnel. And that has helped me in this moment. That's definitely helped me. So you're drawing on these great inner reserves, and luckily you have the rich memory of them, which not everybody can recall yeah. or draw on, and you're able to draw on them. How do you think that you might emerge changed from this? Have you thought that far? Yeah, I, I, I don't know yet, but I'm definitely thinking about it all the time. Like, I've, I think about it from a practical, from an emotional, from a family, from a restaurant family. And I would say the deep human connection that we so desperately need, I'm keeping that one. I'm keeping that. That's staying. We're not, whatever we're doing after that, we, nothing, we're not doing it unless that is kept in. So I do think a more emotional um, society com comes out, it's gonna come out of that, right? And, 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 and it, you can see it in all type, type of uh, interaction. If you look at someone like Dr. Fauci, right? Why do we listen to him besides he's being a doctor and scientist? There's another reason for me, you know there's a soul there. You know he's troubled by this, but that's so. What he, he's troubled, what he can't say, and what he, what he would like to say. That soul matters. It really does. I, um, all right, I have one more question, but I, I will. I want to end on that. I mean, what could be better than that? The soul matters. Um, is it going to change you in the way you relate to your your the people you work with or your family? I, I definitely, yes, the short answer is yes. And I, you know, 9-11 changed us all. It changed the restaurant community, it changed us as a city, it changed the world, it changed our behavior, how we go on the airport, all of, all of these things. Uh, but it also, It took a couple of years for us to get our wheels back up and figure out how it changed us, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't think like, I think it's gonna take a good, even if we have the vaccine 18 months, 15 months, nine months, three months, whatever it must be, I think it will take us a good three, four years to figure out how it changed us. Because it, we're, it, it's too hard to think about it. We're all in it right now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. we are all uh, hurting. 
uh, and we never needed a hug more than now. So I think, I, think I, I don't like to plan when I'm up under it. I really don't because I'm not a good planner. That's, I need to step away from it a little bit. Okay. My greatest hope is that I get to come down and see you and hug you when this is over. Yes. That's awesome. Dear, thank you so much for having me and uh, keep, keep connecting us, Corby. Keep speaking to everybody and keep us connected in the community. We really appreciate you. We really do. Thank you when for When we have people like you to be inspired by, it will be easy. So Marcus Samuelson, thank you for joining us for Aspen so Ideas one day at a time. Thank you.